चुनाव यात्रा पावर्ड बाय मंगलदीप प्रार्थना की महक प्रार्थना के बाद भी प्रार्थना की महक प्रार्थना के बाद भी नमस्कार दिल्ली एलन टॉप की टीम इस वक्त केरला में है हम पहली बार केरला चुनाव कवर करने के लिए आए हैं और पहली बार मैं आई हूं मतलब मेरे साथ जो हैं ये एम जी राधा कृष्णन सर हैं इनका करियर बहुत ही वास्ट रहा है ये 20 सालों तक इंडिया टुडे मैगजीन के भी एडिटर रह चुके हैं मतलब केरला ब्यूरो के कॉरेस्पॉन्डेंट ओके और अभी फ्रीलांस काम करते हैं फ्रंट लाइन के लिए लिखते हैं टेलीग्राफ में कॉलम आता है तो हम ये बातचीत अंग्रेजी में रखेंगे क्योंकि एम जी राधा कृष्णन सर अंग्रेजी जानते हैं मलयालम जानते हैं मलयालम हमें नहीं आती और हिंदी उन्हें नहीं आती तो हमने पेज तय किया कि हम अंग्रेजी में बात कर लेंगे इस बातचीत को रिकॉर्ड करने का मकसद ये है कि मैं सर से नोट्स लेने आई थी समझने आई थी कि केरला चुनाव को किस तरह कवर किया जाए यहाँ के इश्यूज़ क्या हैं यहाँ का कल्चर क्या है इकोनॉमी कैसे चलती है और जब हम केरला के स्टेट इलेक्शंस देखते हैं तो वो बहुत अलग तरह से लोग उस पर वोट करते हैं एंड वेन वी सी द लोकसभा इलेक्शन द वोटिंग पैटर्न इज वेरी डिफरेंट सो सर फर्स्ट स्टार्ट विद दिस पेंटिंग बिकॉज आई आई रियली लव दिस पेंटिंग वेर डिड यू गेट दिस फ्रॉम well this is a persian carpet actually uh, uh, so this is um, is actually depicts the way the arabian cloth traders were trying to sell their uh, you know things to uh, some european clients so it's pretty old it's actually uh, we got it about uh, almost 30 40 years back when uh, one of my relatives presented it to us so we did it this i mean because it's a typical uh, colonial period uh, story that is being uh, depicted so you uh, saved it <laughs> right <laughs> okay so now let's come to kerala uh, you you were talking about europeans you were t- talking about this culture i think kerala is the gateway of everyone from right. uh, the person who founded the place so called india to uh, all the traders That's silk right. route starts yeah, from right, this place right. vasco da gama vasco da gama came uh, yeah, from came kerala only in kerala stepped his first time in kerala in 15th century so that opened the colonial period of uh, the european colonization of asia and and uh, when i was researching for uh, the state i got to know the oldest mosque is in kerala Absolutely. the oldest church is in kerala That's right That's right uh, you know that is the great tradition of kerala we have welcomed Uh, all religions with open hands and it is said that kerala is one place where the jewish refugees political refugees or you know religious refugees did not face any kind of discrimination uh, in, so in, in kochi was the uh, you know uh, it's a place where the jews came and settled and even now those synagogues are still there and there are very few jews still left in kochi most of them have gone back gone to israel but there are still some of the great landmark jewish landmarks in kochi and around so we have this great tradition of cultural and religious harmony because kerala was one of the earliest uh, regions of india which was exposed to the to the west and uh, arabs europeans phoenicians chinese all of them came in search of spices so kerala is known for its famous pepper and cinnamon and other things even vasco da gama came here looking for spices for pepper yeah for pepper cinnamon and so many other things so kerala is still um, you know the land of uh, spices. spices it is called actually the the indian panorama of uh, spices so this is the tradition and kerala so kerala's exposure to the world began uh, almost from the prehistoric days from the days even before jesus christ did it oh so now let's come to the map of kerala like how kerala looks today yeah. uh, on map and then i'll come to the political uh, okay. view of kerala can can we come and stand yeah. so that you can explain we right. are at tiruvananthapuram the right last right. i think the uh, southern tip southern tip of kerala okay from here it see is kanyakumari of hmm. uh, tamil nadu and it is again you know because this is the southern most tip of indian peninsula ओके एंड देन कोल्लम यू राइट पत्ने पट्टा पत्तनम तिट्टा कोल्लम आलपुरा कोटेयम इडिकी इडिकी इज द 
you know it's it's in the western ghats so idiki is one of the greatest um, places for the spice cultivation okay. and um, so as we go north it is ernakulam which is also called kochi which is a port uh, the famous uh, you know mm. port town mm. Mm. and then in trichur is called the cultural capital of kerala because most of the cultural institutions of kerala like kerala kala mandalam it's a premier kerala traditional art school okay it is situated there and then you have palakkad which is actually uh, you know it borders tamil nadu because uh, the other side okay. is tamil nadu and uh, oh. you have a you have a gap through which through the through the uh, you know mountains to go and come then you have this malappuram district uh, which is uh, the only muslim majority district of oh. kerala and um, calicut as we go north calicut also is a very ancient uh, port town this is the district where was called how to Martin. pronounce that this is not koi code koi code it was originally it was called calicut by the by the english okay then with the the the, the the native name or the malayali name is kodi kod and this is Kodikod. where vasco da gama uh, stepped in in 15th century so from here started the colonization of asia oh, okay. and this is wayanad where rajiv rahul gandhi uh, is contesting again mm -hmm. and this is actually it's a very hilly district okay and um, almost uh, half of it and this is also recently known for this animal human conflicts mm. and um, from there you go to the up north kannur kannur is a place where the communist party was born in kerala it is still one of the strongholds of city and the chief minister kapinarayi vijayan is from here okay. and the uh, former chief minister ek nayanar is from here and india's first opposition leader in the pal in the lok sabha ak gopalan is called the legendary akg he, is, he is was from also from kannur. here so uh, kannur is supposed to be the that is also the place which is called the capital of political violence also in kerala there are so many conflicts between the communists on the one and other side one side and the the other parties on the other side and then the northern most district kasar code which is actually which borders the karnataka state okay so there uh, there is a substantial number of karnataka speaking people there so it is a it's again it, it's a mix actually of, yeah that is the best thing about as i said in diversity and there is unity and it's a small sliver of a state hmm. caught between the arabian sea and the western ghats so you uh, your state shares borders with karnataka and tamil nadu only yeah, two states and arkan tamil nadu right okay so now let's start with the culture thing uh, mm. uh, in what regions uh, kerala is divided like kerala was actually in kerala came into being as a state in 1956 mm. so that is when the state's reorganization happened in india and before that the Mal there were three malayalam speaking regions the, the the northern place was called malabar it's a famous malabar region so that is, you know that was when this malabar was known all over the world mm. even you, in bombay you have a malabar hill yes so this is malabar up to uh, you know palakkad up to, up to uh, palakkad. yeah okay uh, so from here from trichur to the these two districts form the kochi region okay the, but malabar was actually administered by the british during the pre independence period it was part of the madras state Okay. Yeah, Madras is now called Chennai. Chennai. So it's a Madras state. And um, Malabar's food is also very famous, no? Cuisine. Yeah, Malabar. Yeah, it's, it's cuisine is famous for its typical, you know, seafood, especially. Okay. And um, and the Muslim delicacies they are supposed to be the best uh, as far as Kerala is concerned. Mm. And 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 um, the central part is Kochi. 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 Uh, you know, Kochi. Uh, so three parts. Malabar, Kochi, and this part actually southern Travan, southern Kerala is actually part of Travancore or Tiruvidangur as it is known in Malayalam. Okay. So Tiruvidangur and Kochi were ruled by native princes. It was a native kingdom. It both of them were native kingdoms. This was under the British. Okay. So in 1956, all these regions came together and the Kerala state was formed. So okay. the, the the thing that connected the three regions was the language called malayalam so now this is a single state from 
the the it was called the IK Kerala or the Unified Kerala state mm. game. Like every, everywhere, it was the same mm. in Andhra, Maharashtra. So th- that is it was based on linguistic reorganization. So it was the mm. you know the came together on the basis of language. Language. Now, when you are talking about language, today itself, Rahul Gandhi said that uh, there cannot be only one leader and one language in this country. And right. parallelly, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi was also in Kerala, and he said that uh, those who are trying to divide India on the basis of north and south are uh, the, they, they are dumb that Absolutely. kind of language he used I think he gave an interview to a and I in which right. he talked about it right. what what do you think about well, it you know Kerala I, you know one of these most uh, uh, important factors that agitated the south was the attempt to impose Hindi on these states which is no more a major issue now mm. In Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, in fact, the Tamil Nadu social social movements and political movements actually actually you know sort of uh, revolved around this anti-Hindi agitations of these people. So they considered it as a alien attempt to sort of uh, smother their own culture, the Dravidian culture. So uh, we have different languages, but unfortunately, many people in the north still consider the entire south as Madras. They call everybody Madrasis. Madras. Actually, that is, not the, that is not the case. Uh, it's more than, I mean, I, 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 it's okay. With, but the problem is that it shows some kind of ignorance. Because yes. um, we have different languages. Kerala, langu- the language of Kerala, as you know, is Malayalam. And Tamil Nadu, it is Tamil Karnataka. So there are so many other languages. So one thing that still agitates the people of South is whenever there are attempts that Hindi is a rational. Even Mahatma Gandhi believed that you know Hindi has to be the language spoken by every state, but that is not possible. So that we considered it as a completely authoritarian way of uh, you know sort of imposing in hegemony of a north, of, you know another region on the other cultures. I have a people. lot of South Indian friends, and okay. they say that we don't have any problem in learning Hindi, yeah, like in right. schools. We, yeah. we were taught Hindi, but the problem is when you try to impose and say that this exactly. is going to be the Rashtra Bhasha Absolutely. or something like that, Absolutely. because that will not create the level playing field. Absolutely. You guys are so good in Hindi and Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Her name but is one particular difference that Kerala had from other states is that we never had a very, very sort of, you know, uh, vicious anti-Hindi uh, sentiment here. We welcomed even Hindi, no problem with Hindi. So, but Tamil Nadu and Karnataka were not like that. But because this kind of uh, language chauvinism was not uh, uh, common in Kerala, made some people think that we are not proud about our language. But that is not the case. We thought that Hindi also has a place and Hindi is good as far as in we are, especially Kerala as I said, Kerala right from those early days, Kerala was a footloose society. Kerala people used to go out of Kerala travel and uh, you know find livelihood in other places and now it is in Kerala everybody knows that Malayalis form the largest Nari uh, community Mm. Um, so Kerala so this language learning a language was actually many Malayalis found it's a it's a good thing that you can be you can communicate with others and it can be uh, you know one of your assets when you go out so that was always there we never sort of were hostile to learning any language or knowing any language or reading language but this kind of anti-Hindi movement was never there in Kerala. Okay, so uh, even today as well there is uh, nothing like we we won't find Hindi speaking uh, people in Kerala. No, no, this has completely changed now. In fact, Kerala has now for the last 10-15 years the largest uh, uh, you know, migrants coming from North India, from Jharkhand, from Bengal, from Orissa, and because in you know, a Kerala is considered a gulf for them, because the minimum wages are so high in Kerala, so people are seen in every walks of life in Kerala. Even in interior villages, you go and you meet people who have come from far away places like Jharkhand, Orissa, and Assam. So this is brought a complete cultural change in Kerala because Hindi has become very common language in Kerala. And ah. from certain places like in Anarun district, there is a place called Perimbaur. My father belonged to that place. Perimbaur is a hub of this, uh, you know, 
uh, migrant workers. So there, even the hotels or the buses have boards in Hindi and, uh, you know, menu uh, written in Hindi, all this you can see. So, but now this is a change that has happened in the last 20 years. The joke is that if you don't know Hindi, it will be, you don't know Hindi, it will be very difficult for you to survive even in Kerala. So if you go to villages, interior villages, if you want to know, uh, you know, if you're lost, mm. um, you have to ask somebody. And most of the people you see on streets will be people from outside. So this is something now, according to the latest uh, statistics, about 20 lakhs uh, migrant workers from non from North Indian states, from Assam and North. You should see the kind of rush uh, in trains that go from Kerala to Northeastern states. So this is something which is, that is mainly because of the construction boom that has happened in Kerala in the last 20 years, 20, 25, not 20 years from 90s onwards, thanks to the remittances from the Gulf. Kerala has the largest diaspora, India diaspora in, in, in the Gulf. So they send in money and Kerala's prosperity, the, the kind of economic prosperity that you see around now is mainly because of the kind of money that is flowing in. So this money has created a lot of job opportunities, a lot of construction, there was a boom in construction industry. So this actually b made Kerala a big haven for this migrant you know, unskilled workers to come. Even now, skilled workers also come. They have learned Kerala, and there are, you know, very interestingly, there are, um, you know, in the last last year and even even year before that, my children of migrant families from coming from Bihar, Bengal, and Orissa and Jharkhand actually are coming up and uh, in, in in and and excelling in their studies. They have actually They're started coming here for studies as well. Yeah, not just coming. They have been they have moved out uh, to Kerala huh. in families. Hmm. So their children actually have grown up in Kerala. They have gone to Kerala schools, and they are excelling in their studies. And they have come up, you know, even even you know, they have been toppers in examinations. So this is something which has happened in the last 20-25 years. Okay. So it's very interesting. People say that a you know, large number of people from Kerala go outside to go to Gulf countries and European countries for their jobs and livelihood. But there is an equal number of people who are coming into Kerala to do the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of jobs that uh, Kerala's, Kerala people are not very happy to do or they think it is, you know, it, they have already prosperous, they have become that prosperous. That was my next question, that why a lot of people travel to Gulf countries or right. uh, travel outside Kerala for job opportunities? Is there something that there are no, jo no job opportunities in Kerala? Or is there something that they don't think that the job is, uh, they are misfit for the job? Yeah, yeah both are there, but the thing is in Kerala has one of the highest unemployment levels. Uh, because unemployment levels, because the industrial agricultural stagnation that Kerala is going through for the last so many decades still continues. So there is considerable lack of job opportunities. And on the one side, you have high education. Kerala is the highest literate state in India. So you have, you know, there are no families which, uh, you know, don't send their children to schools. So most of them are graduates. Many of them are, you know, graduates from, from engineering colleges, medical. But the problem is job opportunities have not grown in commensurate with the kind of education level that has gone up. So this has always been there in Kerala. And for the from the 70s, this, uh, after the oil boom happened in the Gulf, a large number of job opportunities opened up and people started to migrate to Gulf in large numbers. And the money that they they, they earn there and they send them back, send back to their families have been so huge. In fact, 30% of Kerala's GDP actually at one particular year, uh, you know, it was equal to about 30% of Kerala's GDP. Until last year, more than 1 lakh crore rupees is the annual remittance inflow to Kerala. So, so this is a kind of typical Kerala paradox. You have a lot of people going outside for jobs but at the same time this has become the land of opportunities for so many migrant workers to come and work oh. and secondly as you said because kerala has you know so sort of you know reached a kind of a social advancement many youngsters feel that certain jobs they don't want to do like like they're supposed to be the lower kind of job like you know to work in farms 
or to work on streets, construction jobs and things like this happens to every every region, every society that has reached some kind of economic and social advancement. If you go to the West, you see the, the, the poorest sections working in the uh, you know, menial, so-called menial sectors. So this is happening in Kerala. So these are the kind of opportunities that uh, that were filled by the migrant workers from outside. Okay. Um, you were talking about the education level. We right. have heard that Kerala's education model is the best in uh, the country. Right. Why so? What is so different in Kerala? Can you explain? Yeah, Kerala, you know, it's a, that also has a long tradition. Kerala, even in the beginning of 20th century, especially this, uh, you know, the native kingdoms of Travan, Trivedankur and Kochi were top in terms of literacy, public health and things like that. At that time, it was actually called the model states of India, Trivedankur especially. So this tradition continued and a large uh, contribution from the Christian missionaries. So they have been coming to Kerala from 19th century onwards. They set up schools. So because the state schools under the Hindu Rajas, actually they practiced the untouchability. People from the lower sections or the Dalits and the other sections were not uh, initially. They were given permission later, but initially they, they were not uh, uh, given entry to these schools. So this vacuum was filled by the Christian missionaries. Their schools were open to all. So these both these combine to take the state to a higher level of education and literacy. So from 19th century onwards and or the, or the turn of the 20th century onwards, Travancore and Kochi had the best education levels. But after the amalgamation, after the state reorganization, after Malabar also, Malabar was lagging behind. Malabar after the, because it was run by British, they were not very, uh, you know, as benevolent as the as a local the native princes. Uh, so, after Malabar was added to Kerala, the level of education, uh, you know, went up in Malabar also because after 1956, the democratic governments also put a lot of attention to issues like public education and public health. That is why from 1947, if you take the independence period as a kind of a benchmark, from 1947, even into 2024, Kerala is the best in terms of human development. The Nidhi Ayog actually, you know, selected Kerala thrice in a row as the best state in terms of human development, HDI. So economically, economic growth has not been as uh, good as we always wanted. But hum in human development, we were the best always. But, but what happened in from 1980s, the late 80s on, is that because of the kind of money that, you know, came in from abroad, by the people, uh, the, 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 the non-resident Indians, the non-resident Malayalis, Kerala started going up in the economic scale also. So now we, so we, have, though we are not the best about 10th, 9th or 10th in terms of per capita income. Kerala, which was one of the poorest states when at the dawn of independence, is one of the most prosperous states now. So in HDI also Kerala is top. So that is one thing that makes Kerala unique. We have, we are top in both sides. That is something which the other states, which the prosperous states like Gujarat or Maharashtra cannot claim. Because in human development, Kerala is top. In economic growth, if though we are not top, we are not bad. We are in the middle level. Okay. And uh, what about uh, the credit which is given to the uh I, I I would say the left government in Kerala for the education, like they have maintained it, beat beat KK uh, Shelja for the health sector. Right. Like we we oftenly hear about right, it. Right, like right. the it is uh, the credit is given to the left government that they have maintained right. it. They they are uh, making good schemes and policies for education mm -hmm. as well as health. Well, Kerala left definitely deserves more credit to this. But that doesn't mean the other parties, especially the Congress. Kerala, as you know, you know Kerala has been, um, you know, Kerala is a one particular state where the U, the Congress-led UDF government and the, the left-led LDF government have taken alternative, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, innings. In only power. last elections were exceptional. Yeah, only last. One more was there in 1977. Okay. 1977, the Congress came back to power. So that was the first time in Kerala's back history in the, from 1956 where you see a back-to-back -back government. Mm -hmm. So after 1977, 2021 was the second time when the government was actual, actually 
elected back to power. So the beneficiary this time, that time it was Congress, this time it was the left, the CPM led left government. So I would say that Kerala's culture is such that we know Kerala, whether it is left or the right wing, they cannot actually, that is why, you know, economists like Amartya Sen used to give credit to the Kerala society. It is because of the pressure exerted by the people of Kerala that the governments were actually very particular to spend money for welfare and social developments. So the credit actually goes to the Kerala, the, the largest credit actually goes to the Kerala people. So definitely left was always um, uh, in the forefront to invest more for public health and public education. But, but the, the other governments also, not to that extent, but they also did not completely move away from this particular Kerala model of development. That is why it is called the Kerala model of development. So in which everyone has contributed in different ways, not just the communist, the, 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 the political parties, but even, uh, you know, private sector or uh, churches and um, missionaries, as I said. So all of these people have actually contributed to the, the, the kind of contribution to the kind of excellence that Kerala has achieved. That on the other side, if you look from the other side, whatever problems that Kerala face, also most of the most of this, uh, you know, organization, the institution, political parties have an equal share in that also. Yes. Now, please explain to me about the politics of Kerala because uh, first I, I'll ask about the uh, pattern in which state uh, uh, people vote for state elections and right. Lok Sabha elections. Like um, what what I researched, I found out that people vote for. Uh, CPI in state elections, right. but not at all in Lok Sabha elections. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is also a very unique political behavior of Kerala. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, as I said, you know, uh, you know, voting out the incumbent government after every, every five years mm -hmm. and bringing out, bringing the other uh, other party to the power. So like that, this voting pattern also has been there right from the 90, early beginning of the 1970s. So from the 1970s, especially, you see this, uh, you know, con contradictory voting pattern. One for the, you know, they, they vote for the left, uh, not in every election, but in Lok Sabha election, almost if you, if you take the total count, about 13 elections from 1970 and 11 elections, the Congress led uh, front one. Only twice did the left uh, win. So that was, uh, you know, two one-off incidents, but um, the trend has always been like that. The one reason for this is definitely a sense of realism that Kerala voters have. They realize that. Yeah, they realize the left, even if you vote, you know, you vote for left and they win, they're not going to, uh, you know, form a government at the center. So they will not, they will be the opposition or they will not be, they will never be in the part of, part of they will never be part of the central government. But that is not the case with Congress until recently, until this BJP, 2014. yeah, this thing happened in nine, 2014, Congress always formed a government. So Kerala, you know, in fact, I used to say that, you know, Kerala's sense of realism actually um, uh, got the better of its, their ideology. Their ideology may be, still. very interestingly, even when 2019, when the UDF was, you know, there was a landslide for UDF, but two years later, you, far, you find the pendulum well, going to the other years. extreme, where the LDF swept the poll to the assembly. So even if it happens so close by, this kind of contradictory voting behavior is visible. So this is a very special, uh, typical, uh, unique uh, behavior of Kerala voters, uh, which I would uh, ascribe to their sense of realism. Okay, now let's talk about the Lok Sabha seats. I'm aware that there are three seats which are, uh, uh, which, which is being discussed by national media right. a lot. Hmm. One is this Tiruvananthapuram because hmm. of Shashi Tharoor and Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Yeah. The other one is Trishur because of Suresh Gopi right. who is also right. an actor. And the third why one is, is why there? not for Rahul Gandhi. Rahul Gandhi. Right. One we can take Atingal if we want to discuss about. Yeah, that's that. right. You know, uh, BJP, uh, has actually BJP has been increasing its votes since um, like what uh, pattern you said that people uh, uh, vote on the realistic issues and they know that who is in power and who can right. do something for that them. is right and BJP especially after the Kerala has been uh, the another unique thing is Kerala is one state where the BJP has never won a single loss of our seats in history 
Only once an ally in the NDA won a seat. That was only once. But never BJP. Never a BJP. Never the BJP won any single, even a single seat to the Lok Sabha. That 20 Lok Sabha seats. 20 right? Lok Sabha. They haven't won a single seat mm. until now. But NDA won actually in one particular year. Mm. But in assembly also, it's almost similar case. BJP won only once. Only one seat. Uh, name of intravenous district which they lost again in 2021 they won in 2016 and they lost in 2021 21. so bjp is practically invisible in kerala's assembly and Ker among the kerala lok sabha uh, seats okay but its votes have been increasing uh, especially after the 2009 2014 the votes have gone up from 4 to 5 percent now it has reached about 20 to 25 percent in, in this three or four places that's called the a grade constituencies of bjp what, what are those seats? which is one is trivandrum mm. and then artingel and then um, this thing this trishur and uh, and uh, uh, there, there are a few more uh, trivandrum artingel uh, and uh, patanandita okay. patanandita uh, and so these are the four that's or five why Prime Minister Modi has done six rallies so far in right, these right. Uh, Absolutely. like Modi, yeah, yeah, that is right. He, yeah, yeah. and uh, in, in He's coming back to back. Yeah, so this is and this is the first time that a Prime Minister will be visiting Kerala part of election tour. Thri, this is the fourth time. Hmm. Already thri, thrice he has come. And now this is today, it's the fourth time. So this has never happened before. That the particular the reason is that BJP Four time and six rallies. Yeah, four time and six rallies, maybe. Four time and from January onwards, in three months he, he came four times, which has never happened before. So the reason is that because South India is a particular target for the BJP now. If they want to go uh, beyond what they got uh, last time to for 400, they know that you know South India is some is where they have to make a big uh, inroad. South India has largely been um, away from BJP's political influence except for Karnataka. No other states have actually had any BJP government in history. And so, and in Kerala in particular, Kerala is supposed to be called the Bali Kerala Mala. It means, you know, in, in Ramayana, there's a particular mountain where Bali cannot go. touch, <laughs> which is a story it's called. So Kerala is where considered is it, to be... Where is it located? No, it's, no, it's, it's somewhere in the higher. north. But more than that, the point is that it is a, it's a kind of a totally inaccessible place, Kerala BJP. So one of the strangest thing is that Kerala has had a long um, tradition of having very big presence of the RSS. Kerala is where, you know, from 1940s, RSS has been very active. And after Uttar Pradesh, Kerala has the largest number of RSS shakhas. Yeah, you can't believe it. Nobody believes this because more than 5,000 shakhas in Kerala. In Kerala. In Kerala, which, which is, you have a, RSS has about 8,000 shakhas in UP. But it has, Kerala has shakas more than Gujarat, which is supposed to be the BJP's uh, uh, you know, capital. But that, that uh, yeah. RSS is not uh, making any But difference. it doesn't make any electoral benefits to BJP for whatever reasons. So this has been there for the last 20-25 years, but BJP has not made in, any inroad into this. Mainly because of bipolar politics, which is actually dominating Kerala, it is either UDF or the LDF. So in between, there's not been an electoral space for BJP until now. Now, this is this may change in future, but because, you know, given the kind of electoral strength that BJP has been gaining mm -hmm. in the last 20, 20, mm -hmm. 20 years, it's been phenomenal. Because there are these four A-class uh, constituencies that I said, this is where BJP's vote reach about 30%. In particular, mm -hmm. in, in Trivandrum is the only place but the BJP candidates came second in last election and the year before, I mean, the, the election before that in 2014 and 2019. So this is the only seat among the 20 seats where BJP came second. So after that, you know, this four, this four or five, you know, constituencies, they got uh, voting votes to about 20 to, to, to about nearing to 30 percent. 
in certain Trivandrum, it crossed thirty percent actually. And what about this time? What uh, people are claiming that there are two to three seats which BJP is targeting right. a lot, which is Trivandrum. Right. Like BJP. Threshold. Yeah. This is. These are the five, four or five uh, constituencies where BJP is concentrating, and uh, Trichur because Suresh Gopi, the matinee idol, Kerala's uh, superstar, he was a contestant last time also. Then he contested to the assembly. And they he lost, mm. and he didn't come even second. Mm. But he got about thirty percent votes, which is remarkable, because BJP's vote generally hovered around ten percent in Kerala, and that that it is in comparison with that, you see this four or five constituencies where they are reaching thirty percent, which is not a small thing. So, so what is going to happen in, uh, in this election is a uh, is a absolutely a very sharp contest is on in all these four or five constituencies but trivandrum in particular is is the sharpest contest because if at all bjp is to win any seat in this election i personally feel it could be trivandrum rajiv chandrashekar yeah, it could be trivandrum uh, because rajiv chandrashekar is a is a very uh, you know a candidate here who has made a big mark in uh, in in trivandrum for various reasons shashi tharoor is a formidable candidate you know because in his uh, you know he got uh, elected uh, with a margin of about 1 lakh in 2009 and uh, so that has been only last two, in 2014 his margin came to about 15000 votes which is uh, in 2019 he again increased the votes to about 1 lakh so until rajiv chandrashekar was decided as the candidate you know it was a done deal trivandrum everybody expected trivandrum to you know shashi tharoor to win again from trivandrum so shashi tharoor is still the favorite i would say he is the favorite he stands the highest chance but at the same time this time he is going to face a huge he is actually facing a huge challenge from rajiv chandrashekar rajiv chandrashekar as well as the pm face because Whole nation, they are fighting on the name of uh, you. You guys have to yeah, vote for Modi. Right. They But are saying. But that was that was there in 2019 also. Narendra Modi. It was a Narendra Modi driven election. It doesn't make any difference from 2000 now. Okay. It's the same because 2019. You know, in fact, from 2014, it's Modi, Modi all the way. And last year, it last 2019 also. But the candidate also. was not that strong against Shashi Tharoor. Yeah, you can't say because that was, he was a regional uh, BJP leader. Hmm. Uh, he but, came third, no? Yeah, he came third, and he came second last time. And CPI came third. CPI oh. came third. So, the, but wha- what makes Rajiv Chandrashekar, a, you know, more powerful candidate is because. he has very striking similarities with uh, <laughs> with shashi tharoor so please have a seat candidate. and explain to me why, why why you are saying this because this is something very new which i heard that uh, yeah. uh, shashi tharoor and rajiv chandrashekar have similarities it's similarity that is that looks paradoxical from that the outset but actually mm. their mm. you know their differ- mm. their similarities mm. are more than their differences mm. because they both have the same socio political background mm. because they come they are all both belong to the same upper caste uh, community they ha- they were born outside kerala they were they, they were raised outside kerala both of them had uh, you know uh, very cosmopolitan urban sophisticated kind of uh, background in the sense that the both of them studied abroad and they ex- excelled them excelled in their respective careers and they came late into politics both of them and um, both of them are very articulate but not so in malayalam so because they having lived outside kerala for a long time they don't speak very smooth malayalam chashtiru actually definitely have improved uh, he has improved his uh, malayalam from the days he came first in 2009 mm. because they lived most of their lives outside both of them so they are up- and now shashi tharoor was acceptable in trivandrum shashi trivandrum also has this tradition of you know sort of uh, electing candidates of completely different political grounds one after the other because there are you know many vip candidates have actually lost in uh, trivandrum and many vips are one in trivandrum so trivandrum has never been uh, you know absolutely sure constituency for any party but that changed after shashi tharoor came into the picture for various reasons one of the most important reasons was he had a great appeal um, among the young urban almost apolitical kind of crowd 
because he was seen as a author uh, you know what a we diplomat call Gen Z. yeah <laughs> absolutely diplomat you know un background and he was a he speaks beautiful english and he you know he's accepted by everybody so his popularity cut across social and political and gender divides but so that is why there have been occasion there have been elections when even large sections of left actually voted uh, for shashi tharoor because of his image as um, you know a writer orator wherever he goes he makes an impact so that is one reason why shashi tharoor had a smooth sail all these years but now what has changed now is that what has changed now is that um Rajiv Chandrasekhar is appealing to the almost a similar constituency. He is a technologist, he is an entrepreneur. So the IT crowd, the youngsters, the urban crowd or the non-political or the apolitical crowd, all of them have some kind of uh, you know uh, affinity towards Rajiv Chandrasekhar also. So that is why for the first time a constituency which was monopolized by Shashi Tharoor until now will be poached by rajiv chandrasekhar so the sections which voted traditionally for uh, shashi tharoor a large section of them might vote for rajiv chandrasekhar this time so so the the hardcore bjp votes the hindutva votes will go for him and also he is going to attract a section of uh, votes which actually which traditionally went to Shashi Tharoor all in during all these elections. Can we say so that, that is the Trivandrum seat is fifty fifty for BJP and Congress? Uh, I would uh, I would still give a two percent uh, advantage to Shashi Tharoor because uh, minority vote is very important in Trivandrum. You have a large number of Christians and uh, considerable number of Muslims in in, in Trivandrum. Uh, which is very decisive in elections. In fact, in 2014, election was known for this. 2014, until the last round of uh, you know counting was uh, being done, uh, Raj Gopal, the BJP leader, was ahead of Shashi Tharoor. In fact, Raj Gopal even did a press conference as if he has already won the elections. So only in the last round. this things completely tipped. changed yeah completely changed in favor of shashi tharoor those votes largely came from the coastal uh, belt. belt and coastal belt is dominated by catholics latin catholics and fishermen poor fishermen so most of them actually voted for uh, shashi tharoor so even today the the 90% of the minority votes would go to shashi tharoor okay. so that is why i said shashi tharoor still the favorite only thing is the the minority votes may not go to the bjp it never went to bjp in last election also but in 2014 what happened is such a razor thin margin of about 15000 votes in spite of all these things so if these 15000 small margin can be actually uh, uh deciding factor yeah i very deciding for so, so if that goes down again you know if the margin goes down again because of what i said about rajiv rahul rajiv chandrasekhar's uh, peculiarities that could spell trouble to shashi tharoor and the cpim candidate also cpi okay. yeah one last question which i'll ask what are the uh, places you would recommend us to definitely cover because not uh, we are not here only for elections we want to cover kerala's culture and the unique things uh, which you have one to i have noted down in my mind that i have to uh, cover about spices and talk about it why why kerala spices are so right. famous the other i'll uh, definitely try to cover the oldest mosque and oldest uh, right. church right. what other things i'll just note so, it down with my yeah, pen paper yeah and right now uh, my route will be from trivandrum hmm. to vainad so i'll okay, cover trishur uh, koi kod right i think um, from kottayam hmm. it is always good that you take uh, a deviation to the hills okay that is to the munar tekadi region okay. that is the western ghats region where, which mm. is a spices country mm. of kerala mm. so we have this tea estates this uh, spices plantations and all those things so these are the high range areas where you go up to the hills mm. so that is from kottayam you have to take uh, eastern um, sort of turn Okay. So you go to take a day, Munar, and through those plantations, mm-hmm. you can come back. You can get to do get to Arnakulam again. Arnakulam okay. is also Kochi. Okay. It's also a wonderful place where you have this tradition of uh, you know 
maritime uh, activities mm. Mm. which have been going on for centuries i said mm. so you can see this entire uh, and that is also the largest uh, urban center of kerala okay and um, it's a very interesting place but electorally uh, there is in, there is not going to be any major uh, you know uh, sort of uh, surprises there because okay. it has been traditionally dominated by yes. the congress candidate but to, this time the left has a very interesting new woman candidate there mm. and uh, she's uh, making waves there what's her name sir shine 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 okay from arnakulam mm. uh, from arnakulam mm. and uh, their hybi eden is the congress candidate yes, been, we have he has heard about meaning, him a lot yeah he has been always in headlines yeah he has been meaning from there for a long time his mm. father also was a you know congress leader mm. from that mm. region actually but kochi arnakulam and kochi is a fun, wonderful place and it is n- near kochi that you have this um, the oldest mosque okay uh, in kodungallur okay which is um, is the oldest mosque and the churches and in churches also in kottayam you have very old churches you mm. have in kochi there are so many churches okay so this uh, traditional christian uh, culture is there and uh, kochi also has a very unique portuguese uh, culture also okay. uh, so that is also something about uh, you know, visiting and from there is actually as you said you are going to um, you know this uh, why not in minor from why not you can go to kannur and any and food recommendations food absolutely <laughs> what are the must it, it, tries other yeah, than sadhya right yeah in kottayam you can try syrian christian cuisine which is fantastic okay. and uh, ernakulam you have you are vegetarian Uh, he is non vegetarian yeah. he, he can non vegetarian can wonderful pearl fish is there uh, that is the kerala special delicacy okay. that you can try seafood and uh, and backwaters also in kochi you have backwaters yes. fun, fantastic and, and, um, fish and other kind of thing in basically but kerala unlike other south indian states uh, the best food there is non vegetarian non vegetarian yeah but you Nothing have the kerala like typical no, no kerala feast is also famous kerala feast okay yeah kerala sadhya Uh, that famous, I that tried. That you can try in Trichur. It's mm. fantastic place. Okay. Yeah. Trichur. So, Trichur. Yeah. Trichur. Uh, okay. Trichur. 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 There, there so Sadhya is too good. Trichur. That's why I said Trichur. Trichur. Okay. So now it is Malayalamized. And, and I, I follow a girl called that uh, Thalassery girl. She mm. her Instagram name is that Thalassery girl. Right. Right. So she cooks vegetarian meals from Kerala. Okay. So I am so, more interested yeah, in that. Yeah. Thalassery uh, is actually again is a non-vegetarian. to see in center okay. you have the best uh, you know seafood there and uh, calicut you have the best biryanis okay uh, <laughs> i think amitesh is going to enjoy more than me <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely kerala is known for its seafood kerala is a coastal state so the best food comes from the seafood oh. but i am not a big <laughs> seafood man <laughs> but uh, so so syrian christian So you have to taste all these different kinds of things. So then uh, you have the appams. It's appams, very famous. Yes. Yeah, and appam is actually I, mixed I've with. I have seen idi appams in so yeah, many films, idi, like that round round right, thing. Right, right. Idi appam is uh, like spring roll kind of yes. thing. You have the appam where it is actually the Kerala liquor is uh, used actually to, oh. to pump it. You know, uh, wow. so toddy is called it. It's a coconut hmm. based, uh, oh, tender liquor. coconut based, uh, indigenous uh, local local liquor. liquor. which is uh, even not as uh, you know intoxicating as even beer okay uh, if you take more definitely you will get mm. completely kicked otherwise we have the best um, food available in the local roadside toddy shops okay. again for the non vegetarians and what you call it Ch- chayakad 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 i heard a lot about the history of chayakad like how yeah. 19th century it started and it shaped the political discussions absolutely there's a, actually there were a number of fields we call it chai ki tapri in north right. india like yeah, uh, people come sit and absolutely. but uh, here kind of yes mm. but here i see a different thing there are uh, bananas hanging in right, the right. chayakad yeah, absolutely and trivandrum is known for, you don't get this kind of bananas even out say trivandrum you have okay. all kinds of different have to colors. cover the economy of banana in trivandrum yeah it's very interesting you have the red bananas it's called completely yeah, red i saw that black color uh, red yeah, yeah, red black color yeah uh, that, that's okay. a medicinal it has immense medicinal value as well. you want some water or something no, 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 no water you can have it's also high temperature have. and it's okay no. yeah shall i go and get you one no no it's mm-hmm. fine it's fine mm. after this uh, banana thing we'll just 
go yeah, and in, also in Kolan, lottery yes, culture you yeah, didn't lot, yeah that is also very important because lottery is one of the biggest source of revenue for the state we and have, it's very controversial as well some people say it's very bad it's it's yeah, destroying it, homes yeah i don't th- i mean that is right morally you can say that you know that is uh, if you are an addict mm. i mean if you are an addict of anything it's bad if you are an addict of liquor addict of smoking whatever it is so lottery also can actually but that is only very small number but lottery has been a mainstay of kerala's economy from 1960s kerala had one of the earliest lottery is run by the state mm. and alcohol also is a very problem it's also a major source of revenue kerala is one of the after punjab kerala has a high level of uh, alcohol consumption which is not good and um, so these are things but in kollam for instance the next district you have the cashew nut that's the cashew nut con- uh, you know it's famous Kullam outside cashew. kerala mm-hmm. kollam cashew nut rubber in in kottayam rubber economy is so important rubber natural rubber kerala is the largest uh, you know the state with the highest uh, rubber Which we used natural to rubber eraser. cultivation oh, not oh. that rubber for, oh, used in you know tires okay. and hmm. for everything okay natural rubber is used for everything and gloves or medical oh. gloves tires yes, yes, yes. aircraft okay. tires yes so kerala is the largest uh, rubber producing it's uh, in trivandrum only no cotton basically cotton okay. Kottayam is called the rubber country. Actually, you know, the, the money country. people. So many people are dependent. The, the plantation money. You know, the huge, rich uh, plantation plantation owners. They run these rubber estates. But unfortunately, recent times rubber prices have crashed. But otherwise, rubber used to be the rubber plantation owner was supposed to be the richest in Kerala. So you have um, that. that there. And, uh, and i'll cover those villages also where uh, there are a lot of atms because most of the people are in kalpa country absolutely that is tiruvalla that is yeah Thiruvalla. it is in patanamthitta district if you're going to patanamthitta it's very hmm. interesting because i can't any son is a bjp candidate okay so that's a very dramatic uh, kind of thing to happen in kerala okay i can't any was the be all and end all of kerala's congress suddenly this boy this young man huh. actually shifts his political loyalties to him to in fact bjp were, very very fierce uh, duel of words there is uh, one daughter and, and one son no no both of, antony has both uh, do- sons karnakaran had one daughter ah, and son. that daughter, daughter also shifted to, to bjp, BJP. Yeah. yeah that that uh, right, right. one one's daughter and one's son right antony's was unexpected because uh, both of them are unexpected in fact you know, antony father and son had a very fierce bitter wordy duel these days after this mm-hmm. thing happened. but it's interesting political i had been to patanamthitta it's a very interesting political because the economy kerala's uh, highly respected cpm leader is contesting there the dr thomas isaac is a highly regarded economist he is the cpm candidate there mm, very tough fight so it's very thank you so much for all the notes yeah, and information sir right, right. Uh, we'll definitely try to cover kerala from uh, a kerala perspective how how they want uh, north indians to know kerala and Absolutely. i'll try to learn some of the malayali words right, like right, i learned namaskara good. and namaskaram namaskaram mm, okay namaskara namaskara is kannada. Kannada. <laughs> kannada okay namaskaram i learned mund is uh, one here and thing. set is uh, set kerala is sari interest it's kerala okay, typical yes, yes. ಚೆಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್ಟಿಟ್
most of this wealth got accumulated because the 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 king actually surrendered his kingdom to Sri Patanabha. Okay, and so, sir, why Malayalis are so obsessed with gold? Like not only Malayalis, the whole yeah, South India South is India. obsessed with gold. Yeah, why? That's part of tradition and culture. Tradition and culture yeah, only. Yeah, nothing. Only nothing else. So you and also, now, your now, wife also owes too much gold. Not much. They are not very gold <laughs> people, <laughs> but uh, and it's also a safe investment now. Because Kerala is now it's stock exchange and things like that. No industry, so people find gold. Continuously going up, the price is going up now. It's more than fifty thousand rupees for one one sovereign. Mm. So uh, one of my friend was telling me that uh, if if my grandmother visits me or my mother visits me or if I visit their place, they'll definitely take me to uh, local uh, jeweler and they'll buy something like that's right. They'll force me to buy. Right, you don't know, right. no, take something. Or something internationally, like. also the most most of these Indian jewelers actually from Kerala and you know, Alukas. And if you go to the girls, it almost looks like a Kerala street. You have jewelry shops on both sides, so gold is a big uh, yellow metal. <laughs> <laughs> There is a kind of a fetish for that. Thank you, you know, so okay. much, sir, no, for no, all the valuable right, inputs. ये बातचीत आपको अंग्रेजी में सुनने को मिली क्योंकि अगर मैं बीच बीच में रुकती और उसे ट्रांसलेट करती तो शायद वो एसेंस चला जाता लेकिन बाकी बातचीत आपको इस तरह से नहीं मिलेगी हम कोशिश करेंगे कि तुरंत ब्रेक कर करके ट्रांसलेट करते जाएं आपके लिए लेकिन अगर आपको अंग्रेजी आती है तो मैं बहुत श्योर हूं कि आपको ये बातचीत सुन के केरला के बारे में काफ़ी कुछ नई जानकारियां समझ में आई होंगी कैसी लगी कमेंट बॉक्स में बताइएगा इतने देर तक इतनी गर्मी में कैमरे के पीछे मेरे साथी थे अमितेश जो इतना भारी कैमरा थामे हुए बिना पसीना पोछे खड़े रहे तो उनको ज़्यादा शुक्रिया कहिएगा मैं सोनल हूँ लल एंड देखते रहिए शुक्रिया